الله أكبر الله أكبر Assalamu alaikum brothers and sisters Please can I ask everyone to move forward Move forward There's a lot of space in, in the front um, uh, I would like to welcome you all um, and uh, to the second lecture uh, of this uh, blessed month of Ramadan. Today we've got uh, Brother Abu, uh, Abul Abbas Naweed, and he's our dear brother. He's come from uh, Majid al Sunnah um, in Nelson. He's the Imam there. Um, he's got a great amount of knowledge, alhamdulillah. He's always, it's always a pleasure to have him here with us. Uh, so I'll pass it on to him. Jazakallah khairan. Barakallah Jazakallah. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله وصفيه وخليله المبعوث رحمة للعالمين صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين We praise Allah سبحانه وتعالى who has guided us and had it not been for his guidance then we would not be upon this path Allahumma inna nas'aluka al-birra wa taqwa wa min al-amali ma tarza Allahumma inna na'udhu bika min adhab al-qabri wa min adhab jahannam wa min fitnat al-mahya wa al-mamat wa min sharri fitnat al-masih al-dajjal Allahumma alimna ma yanfa'una وَنْفَعْنَا بِمَا عَلَّمْتَنَا وَزِدْنَا عِلْمًا أَيُّ الْإِخْوَةِ As you will all appreciate, we are in this blessed month and these blessed days, the last ten days of Ramadan. The last ten days of Ramadan. And the majority of Ramadan has passed by. The majority of Ramadan, it has passed by. But... The greatest days of Ramadan are in front of us. So even though the first 20 days are the majority of Ramadan and they are gone, but the last 10 days, they are the greatest days. And the next 8 to 9 days are still ahead of us. Bithinillahi ta'ala. And of course, Ramadan is a very important month in the life of every Muslim is the most important month and most beloved month to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and therefore it should be the most beloved month and the most beloved time of the year for every person who has Iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this is because in Ramadan the good deeds which you do the sadqa, the charity which you give the dhikr, dua, the Qur'an which you recite, the reward is magnified. And the sins which you have fallen into previously, they are forgiven in this blessed month. تُفْتَحُ فِيهِ أَبْوَابُ الْجَنَّةِ The doors and the gates of Jannah are open in this month. وَتُغْلَقُ فِيهِ أَبْوَابُ النَّارِ And the gates or the doors of the fire are shut in the month of Ramadan. And the people of Iman, the believers, when Ramadan enters, they find within them strength and enthusiasm to worship Allah more than they do in any other day throughout the year. And also, how many people are there who perhaps were distant from Islam, distant from Allah, and then Allah subhanahu opens their hearts in Ramadan and they become repentant. And they return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And how many hearts are hardened throughout the year. And then Ramadan enters and they find their hearts become soft and tender. And they become connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in reality, the month of Ramadan is a great blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we should remember him in this month. And we should show gratitude to him that he has allowed us to live until Ramadan and to live throughout Ramadan. He said, Subhana Fadkuruni Adkurkum Mashkuruli Wala Takfurun. Remember me 
and I shall remember you. And show gratitude to me and do not become unappreciative. Do not become ungrateful. So we should show shukr to Allah subhanahu for the blessings which he has <coughs> given us. And this is also an important point that we remember that Allah subhanahu, he obligated upon us the fasting of Ramadan, not for his benefit. The fasting of Ramadan does not benefit Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He obligated it upon us for our own benefit. <coughs> we are the ones who are in need of Ramadan. Allah subhanahu is not in need of our fasting. And this is from his mercy subhanahu wa ta'ala that he obligates upon the people that which benefits them. Otherwise, there's no benefit for him. And then he rewards you for doing that thing which benefits you. Naam. Firstly, he legislates upon you that which benefits you. And then he rewards you for fulfilling that which is in your own benefit. And this is only due to his mercy and his grace and his kindness upon us subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is Rabbu Samawati wal Ard. He is the Lord of the heavens and the earth. Khaliq al Kaum. He is the creator of all creation. He is Ar Rabb, the Lord. He is Al Malik, the Sovereign. He is Al Qadir, the old the all able. He is Al Ghalab, Al Qahar, the one who overpowers and subjugates, and there is none who can overpower him. He is Qul Allahu Ahad. Say he is Allah, and he is one and unique. Allahu Samad. He is Allah, As Samad, the one who has no need of creation, and all creation are in need of him. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. He never gave birth, nor was he given birth to. وَلَمْ يَكُلْ لَهُ كُفُوًا أَحَدٍ And there is nothing and nobody which is equal or comparable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We say, Subhana. What does Subhana mean? At-Tasbih, the ulama mentioned, تَنْزِيهُ اللَّهُ عَنْ كُلِّ نَقْسٍ وَعِيبٍ when we say Subhanallah, we are glorifying Allah above any imperfection or deficiency. This is the meaning of Subhanallah. We are saying, when you say Subhanallah, you are saying, Oh Allah, you are so perfect that you are glorified above any imperfection, deficiency or weakness. And so, this Lord with all of these beautiful names and beautiful attributes, do you think he benefits from you abandoning your food and drink for a few hours in the day? Does not benefit him at all. Because, Ya Yuhnas Antumul Fuqara, O people, you are the ones who are poor and needy in front of Allah. And Allah is Al Ghani Al Hamid. Allah is independent, self sufficient, all praised does not need and require creation to do anything. If every single one of us, from the jinns and the humans, from the time of Adam السلام, all the way to Yawm Al Qiyamah, if all of us came together and all of us fasted every single day of Ramadan, from the jinns and the humans, from Adam to the last person on Yawm Al Qiyamah at the same time, does this increase Allah in anything? Does this benefit Allah subhanahu in anything? It does not benefit him at all. And conversely, if every single one of us, from the humans and the jinn, from the time of Adam السلام, to the last person on Yawm Al Qiyamah, if we all came together and disobeyed Allah and did not fast the days of Ramadan, does this take anything away from the greatness and the glory of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? <coughs> takes nothing away from him. Why? Because he is Subhana. He is the one who is glorified. He is the one who is perfect. And the one who is perfect and complete and glorified cannot be added to or taken away 
from. So we realize, therefore, who benefits from Ramadan? We benefit. We are in need of Ramadan, and Allah Subhanahu is not in need of us worshipping Him or leaving alone food and drink. And neither is the objective of Ramadan merely staying away from food and drink. In the hadith of Abu Hurairah, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, مَنْ لَمْ يَدَعْ قَوْلَ الزُّورِ وَالْعَمَلَ بِهِ فَلَيْسَ لِلَّهِ حَاجًا يَدَعْ طَعَامَهُ وَشَرَابَهُ That the one who does not abandon evil speech and evil action, Allah has no need from that person to leave his food and drink. It benefits Allah subhanahu in no way. So Ramadan, as they say, Ramadan is madrasa. Ramadan it's a school. Ramadan teaches us many things. Ramadan is an avenue to refine our soul and our deen and strengthen our iman. And from the blessings of Ramadan is that it is an opportunity for us to return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to reconnect with Him after becoming distant from him subhanahu wa ta'ala and Ramadan is an opportunity for us to attain his love and in reality this is the purpose of every single Muslim any person who has even the smallest amount of Iman if you were to ask him that truly look into yourself what do you really want and any mu'min if you say to a mu'min Define for me success. If I could give you anything right now, and then you say, I am now successful, what would you ask for? And any person who has mithqalu dharra, even the smallest amount of iman in his heart, will say jannah. If I was given jannah today, I have succeeded. And this is success. Not houses and cars and women and children and offspring and money. All of that, all of that goes. Real success for the person of Iman is entering into Jannah. This is the pursuit of every single person of Iman. And Allah Subhanahu wa said in the Quran, فَمَنْ زُحْزِحَ عَنِ النَّارِ وَأُدْخِلَ الْجَنَّةَ فَقَدْ فَازْ Whoever is removed from the fire and is entered into Jannah, فَقَدْ فَازْ He has tasted the true success. He has seen and tasted salvation and success. As for the life of this world, is nothing except mata'al ghurur. There is some beautification in it, but it is very deceptive. And from the deception of the dunya, is the Salaf, they used to liken the dunya and the pleasures of the dunya to drinking salt water. Salt water, the more you drink, what happens? The more thirsty you become. So you become thirsty, so you drink more salt water. And then this increases in your thirst. So, Talib dunya the one who seeks the dunya, pursues the dunya, lives only for the dunya, nothing else, will never ever be satisfied. Impossible for him to be satisfied. And it's also important to mention, while saying that, that Islam does not prevent us from attaining something from the dunya. Islam was not sent down and revealed to stop you being successful in the dunya. And in fact, we find the greatest Sahaba, the most pious of the A'imma, and they were very successful in the dunya. Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we speak about his zuhud and his struggles, his difficulties, the poverty that he went through. But don't forget that there were times and moments and years in his life in which he was also very, very successful. And had he wanted, could have been very wealthy. As you know, uh, just before his marriage to Khatija radiallahu anha, he was a very successful businessman, very profitable. 
good trader. And then there were other companions like Abu Bakr radiallahu an, Abdurrahman ibn Auf, very wealthy. What is the nickname of, of Uthman ibn Affan? Al-Ghani. He's known as Uthman al-Ghani. Uthman the wealthy. Because he gained a lot of wealth and he used to help Islam with that wealth. And then there were great scholars and a'imma who came afterwards. Al-Imam Abu Hanifa, Nu'man ibn Thabit al-Kufi rahimahullah, was very wealthy. And Al-Hafid ibn Hajar was very wealthy. So there were many great pious Sahaba, Tabi'een, Ulama who were wealthy. And Islam has not been sent down to prevent you from becoming wealthy. This is why if you contemplate the ayat of the Quran, when Allah subhanahu wa speaks about giving in charity, what does He, what does he say? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, and the meaning of is that they donate some of that which we have given them. Allah subhanahu did not say that that which we have given them, they donate. He said some of the, what we have given them, they donate. And this min this is known as min yani min ba'di ma razaqnahum yunfiqun. Some, a small portion of the risk which we have given them, the success that we have given them, they give in the way of Allah to benefit other people. So Islam does not even request from us to give all of our wealth, even though. It is the wealth of Allah. It is Allah subhanahu who has given us that wealth. And this is why if you look at the rules of zakat, as you all know, how much do we give in zakat? How much? 2.5%. 2.5% of what? Huh? No. Wealth that has not been used for one year? Ahsant. No, this is the best answer. 2.5%, uh, not of your income, not your profits, not your assets, your savings. Meaning, take your profit out, take your investments out, take your basic uh, amenities and your costs of living, take all of them out, and then whatever, whatever is left over, 2.5% of that. So very little which we are expected to give. And the more a person gives, alhamdulillah, the better. So the point is that although Islam does not prevent us from becoming successful, but this should never be the desire and the pursuit of a Muslim. وَلَا تَجْعَلِ الدُّنْيَا أَكْبَرَ هَمِّنَا Dua of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam O oh Allah, do not make the pinnacle of my desires and my focus and my pursuit this dunya. Don't make this my absolute desire. Because success for the believer Ultimately, it is Jannah. And how should you interact? How should you interact with success in the dunya? How should you interact with money? Zuhud, you know, we hear about Zuhud and the word Zuhud. Zuhud is not what you have in your hand. You could have a million pounds in your hand, in your bank account. You can still have a Zuhud. Zuhud is the state of your heart. So Islam does not prevent you owning or possessing a million pounds. But what it stops you doing is your heart being attached to that million pounds. So the believer, even he, if he has the dunya in his hands, but his heart is always connected to the akhirah. This is the difference between, between the, the, the mu'min and the kafir. And therefore, your ikhwah, your greatest supplication should be something which is very easy. Eight words. Everybody can memorize these eight words. Whether you speak Arabic or not, I want you to memorize these words in Arabic. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the hadith of Mu'adh, he came to a person and he said to him, Ma taqulu fi salatik? 
<coughs> what do you say in your dua? What do you say in your salah? Meaning, what do you say in your dua? And the man replied, he said, Oh, Messenger of Allah, I don't have much which I say in my dua. But I say, Allahumma inni as'aluka al-jannah wa a'udhu bika min al-nar. I say, O oh Allah, I ask you for jannah and I seek refuge in you from the fire. What did the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say to him? Wa hawlaha nudandin. He said, also us, me, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, our dua is also something around that. So if there's no other dua that you've memorized in Arabic, seven, eight words. Allahumma, repeat after me. Allahumma. Allahumma. Inni. As'aluka. Al-Jannah. Allahumma. Inni. As'aluka. Al-Jannah. Wa a'udhu bika. Min al-Nar. Um, seven words <coughs> that every single person can memorize. Uh, who can repeat this dua to me? Put your hands up. Naam. Who's going to repeat the dua to me? Tafadrahi. Allahumma inni as'aluka minal jannah. As'aluka al jannah. Al jannah wa a'udhu bika minal nar. Wa a'udhu bika minal nar. Another person? Tafadrahi. Allahumma inni as'aluka al jannah wa a'udhu bika minal nar. Ahsant. Another person? Another person? Another person? Another person? And like I said, when this man told the Prophet Sallallahu that this is my dua which I say in my salah every day the Prophet Sallallahu replied wa hawlaha nudandin that this is also our dua this is a dua which we make ayyul ikhwa in your sujood in fact in your salah in your salah there is only one moment or one period in which you have to remain silent only one position in the salah which you should not be speaking. And that is when the Imam is reciting. That is the only time, that is the only time in which you should not be saying anything. When the Imam is reciting, then you have to remain silent. In every other position of the Salah, there is no silence. The Salah was not le legislated for silence. The Salah was legislated for you to say something. So there should never be a moment in the Salah in which you are not saying anything, except when the Imam is reciting, then you're quiet and you listen to the Imam and you concentrate on what the Imam is saying. So for example, like in Taraweeh or Qiyam al-Layl, when the Ruku becomes long, and you have said Subhana Rabbi Al-Azim three times, and the Imam is still in Ruku, the mistake that many Muslims make is after they've said Subhana Rabbi al -Azim three times, they just become silent. And perhaps the Imam is continuing for another 10 seconds, 15 seconds, and they're just silent in that ruku. This is a mistake. The least which you do is you continue repeating your tasbihat. If you've not memorized any other dhikr, then at the least, just continue repeating your Subhana Rabbi al -Azim, Subhana Rabbi al -Azim, Subhana Rabbi al -Azim, until the Imam stands up once more. Similarly, when you go into sujood, the same happens. The, you say your tasbihat three times, Subhana Rabbi al-A'la, the Imam, because of Qiyam al Tarawih, he's remaining in his sujood, and the Muslims are quiet. This is incorrect. The least which you can do is Keep repeating, Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la, Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la, Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la. But now you have a dua with you. Allahumma inni as'aluka al-jannah wa a'udhu bika min al-nar. So now that you've memorized that dua, then utilize your time in the sujood and make the, yani, this dua in that time. Also, uh, Ramadan, it's a great opportunity for us to reconnect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And this is the title of the reminder Reconnecting with Allah Meaning Your hearts become close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala And this is the primary focus of every Muslim How do I become closer to my Lord? How do I attain His love? How do I attain His mercy? And the ulama they have a famous saying They say لَيْسَ شَأَنْ أَنْ تُحِبْ وَلَكِنَّ شَأَنْ أَنْ تُحَبْ That it isn't important that you love Allah This is not important What is important is Allah loves you This is more important that Allah loves you Because there are many people who claim that they love Allah There are many people who claim that they love the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so the claim or the slogan is easy What is more important is does Allah love you? Have you fulfilled those actions by which you can attain the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Otherwise us claiming that we love Allah and every person doing his own thing claiming he loves Allah This is not important And why was the Quran revealed? The Quran was revealed to teach us how to attain the love of Allah. This is why the Quran was revealed. The Quran was revealed to teach us how to connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It was revealed to teach us how to attain the mercy of Allah. This is the primary objective of the Quran. The stories that we find in the Quran, remember the Quran is not a book of stories. Those stories which are mentioned, they are not mentioned just for academic knowledge or fun facts. No, there's an objective behind those stories. When we read the stories of how Allah subhanahu rewarded certain nations and how Allah destroyed certain nations, it's not just for information. It's to remind us to fear Him subhanahu wa ta'ala and to hope for His mercy to become connected to Him again. When Allah subhanahu wa mentions the rewards of Jannah and the punishments of the fire. It's not mere information. The objective behind this information and these stories is that we become connected to Him and we try to attain His love and desire His mercy and fear His punishment. So if you want to reconnect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you want to attain His love, the manual is the Qur'an Look into the Qur'an The Qur'an teaches you How to reconnect to Allah Subhanahu And how to attain His love The first thing that the Qur'an teaches us If we want to connect to Allah And to love Him and to attain His love Is at taqwa He said Subhana Bala man awfa Bi'ahdihi wa taqa فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ يُحِبُّ الْمُتَّقِينَ Whoever fulfills his pledge with Allah وَالتَّقَى And he has a taqwa Then إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُحِبُّ الْمُتَّقِينَ Allah loves the people of a taqwa <coughs> So this shows us, this ayah shows us That the way to connect with Allah And to attain the love of Allah And for you to love Allah Is through a taqwa and the meaning of taqwa here <coughs> is always being conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Always being aware of Allah. Before you make a statement, think, does this statement please Allah or does it anger Allah? Does this statement take me closer to Jannah or further away from Jannah? This is a taqwa. Before you make a decision, before you Begin a relationship Before you conclude a business transaction Before you do an action Be conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Be aware of Allah Be very wary of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala This decision This contract This job This relationship This person that I'm going to talk to This thing which I'm going to look at This decision which I'm going to make Does it anger my Lord Or does it please my Lord does it take me to his mercy or does it take me to his punishment? And 
Abu possible for you to connect with Allah and to attain his love through shirk, through bid'ah, through sins, through music, through dancing. You can never attain the love of Allah through this. Those groups, those deviated sects, I think you will have seen them on, on YouTube and clips. And they think, they call themselves awliya. They call themselves Aashikun Nabi, the lover of the Prophet. And all of their religion, what is it? Shirk, bid'ah, music, money, women, sinning, every type of bid'ah they are doing. They can, you can never attain the love of Allah. You can never connect with Allah through this. Because this opposes a taqwa. Some of them, they go to the extent, they'll say that my connection with Allah is so strong, I am such a great wali, that he has removed from me the obligation of salah. I don't need to pray salah anymore. This is how connected I am with Allah. That person is only connected with shaitan. Because the greatest wali, Nabiullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he never lived a day in which the obligation of Salah was removed from his shoulder. Never. He fasted nine Ramadans in his lifetime. It was never removed from him. The obligation of Islam, <coughs> an obligation upon every single Muslim, from the Anbiya to the most common Muslim. All of us are Ibadullah. All of us are worshippers of Allah. We share this even with the prophets and the messengers. One thing which is common between us and Ibrahim alayhi salam, Musa alayhi salam, Isa alayhi salam, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, is that all of us were worshippers of Allah subhana. That which Allah subhana ordered us with, He ordered the prophets with. And the Sahaba as well. So connecting with Allah, the love of Allah, the wilaya of Allah is only attained through at taqwa. It is never attained through these actions of shirk and bid'ah and sinning. Some of them, it's hilarious but it's actually sad. They say that I have connected with Allah so deeply, it's mentioned the kiramat al-awliya, from the miracles of the awliya. That Fulan, our Shaykh, our Peer, our Murshid, his connection and his wilaya with Allah is so strong that he does not need to go to the Kaaba to make tawaf. The Kaaba comes to him and makes tawaf around him. <laughs> and the miskin is living in India or Pakistan or Bangladesh or any country. Now it's mentioned in some of the books, the ulama, they mention this. And Sheikh Abdul Zakir al-Badr, I remember this from his lesson. He said, then they built, a, they based a fiqhi ruling on this. They said, that if the Kaaba goes to our Shaykh, our Wali, our Peer, Murshid, and it makes tawaf around him, then do we face the Qibla or do we face our Shaykh? Mas'ala fiqhiya. They say, ikhtalaf al-ulama. The ulama differed. Ala qawlain. Some of them said, you go back to the Asal and you face the Qibla. Others said, no, you face the Wali. Now, this is a misguidance, subhanAllah. We're smiling, but this is misguidance. So this is not becoming a wali of Allah. This is not loving Allah subhana. قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهِ فَاتَّبِعُونِ يُحْبِبُكُمْ اللَّهِ Allah subhana told us in the Quran how to attain the love of Allah. He said, say, if you claim to love Allah, follow me. Meaning follow the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. What is the result? يُحْبِبُكُمْ الله. Then Allah will love you. This ayah, Ibn Kathir rahimullah, mentions the Salaf used to call it Ayatul Imtihan. The ayah which is a test. The ayah which is an examination. It is testing your claim of loving Allah. And uh, Ibn Kathir mentions that this ayah was revealed regarding a group of people who approached the Prophet wasallam from the Yahud saying that we love Allah. So Allah subhana tested them with this ayah. Qul, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, say to those people who have, who have approached you 
and they are claiming that they love Allah. In kuntum tuhibun Allah. If you are truthful and sincere in your claim of loving Allah, fattabi'uni. Then follow my way, my sharia. The sharia of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Yuhibibukum Allah. Then Allah will love you. Wa yaghfir lakum dhunubakum. And he will forgive for you your sins. Ayatul imtihan. Ibn Kathir Rahimullah, he said this ayah in Surah Ali Imran, he said, هذه الآية الكريمة حاكمة على كل من ادعى محبة الله that this ayah is like a judge upon every single person who claims the love of Allah ولا يتبع الطريق المحمدي but he does not traverse the way of Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم that he is lying in that which he has claimed. The only way to connect with Allah and to attain the love of Allah is al ittiba following the sunnah of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And brothers and sisters, following the sunnah of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam, not only in your salah, not only in your wudu, every single aspect of your life. Maintaining taqwa of Allah, not only in the masjid, every situation. We have to follow the sunnah of the Messenger We have to maintain the taqwa of Allah in our marriages, in our families, in our businesses, in our charity, in our ikhlas, in our sincerity, in our salah and zakah, in how we talk to our elders, in obedience to our parents, in how we teach our youngsters. Whether you're in the masjid, you're at home, you're amongst believers, you're with non-Muslims, you're at college. Islam is not restricted to only the masjid. Taqwa is not restricted to only your salah. The Prophet ﷺ did not come to only teach you how to make wudu. <coughs> there is taqwa and ittiba in every single aspect of our life. All of those situations I mentioned, if you want to connect to Allah, then fear Allah in every one of those situations. In the first ayah of Surah An-Nisa, what did Allah Subhanahu say? Ya ayyuhan nasu attaqu rabbakum alladhi khalaqakum min nafsin wahida wa khalaqa minha zawjaha wa batha minhuma rijalan kathiran wa nisa'a Then what did he say? Wa attaqu Allah alladhi tasa'aluna bihi wal arham He said, and have taqwa of Allah with regards to your arham with regards to your family members. Even Silatul Rahm, the ties of kinship, and how you treat your uncles and your aunties, and your Arham, fear Allah. So there is even the Taqwa of Allah with regards to your family members, and your marriages, and also al ittiba following the Sunnah of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Also, from the ways of attaining the love of Allah and connecting to Allah is a sabr, patience. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, Wallahu yuhibbu sabirin. Verily Allah loves the people of a sabr. So you cannot, we cannot connect to Allah and attain the love and the mercy of Allah without sabr, without patience. Worshipping Allah requires patience. Staying away from sins requires patience. Dealing with the struggles of life requires patience. Allah Subhana, He ordered the greatest man, meaning Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, He told him to be patient. He said, Fasbir kama sabara ulul azmi min rusul O Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you demonstrate the patience which the great mighty messengers who came before you, the patience which they demonstrated. Even Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminded him and ordered him that you also have to be patient. Just as Ibrahim and Musa and Isa before you and Nuh alayhi wa sallam, how they were patient. Like I said, the ibadat which we have been obligated with, also the prophets and the messengers were, were obligated with those ibadat. And Ibn Kathir mentions 
that Allah subhanahu wa reminded the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to show patience, sabr, like the patience of the previous Prophets and Messengers. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he showed so much patience that he exceeded the Prophets and the Messengers. And this was the greatness and the virtue and the taqwa of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So also we cannot connect with Allah, attain the love of Allah and we are, uh, yani we don't have, we are impatient, hasty. The minute we see uh, any desire, we follow it straight away. No self-control, no self-discipline, no looking away, no looking down, no switching things off, not differentiating between halal and haram. Money is money, profit is profit, doesn't matter, it's halal, haram, good, bad, pure, impure. This is not a sabr. So also, your ikhwa, a sabr, maintain patience. And then the last thing I'm going to mention, also the Quran teaches us that if we want to connect with Allah and we want to attain His love, then also we have to be muhsineen. We have to be people of goodness in how we interact with each other as brothers and sisters and how we interact with the non-Muslims, neighbors, family members. We have to be people of ihsan, people of goodness. Because Allah subhana, wallahu yuhibbul muhsineen. Because Allah loves the people of al-ihsan. He loves the people of goodness and benefit. Those who serve their communities. So we cannot be, we cannot connect with Allah and attain the love of Allah and we are musi'een. We are harming others. We are irritating others. Rather, Allah loves al-muhsineen. And Allah, in Allah, la yuhibbul mu'tadeen. Allah does not love those people who violate the rights of other people or irritate and annoy other people. And what is al-ihsan? What, I mean, if you want to live al-ihsan, demonstrate al-ihsan, what is al-ihsan? Al-Hasan al-Basri, rahimahullah, and we'll end with this. He was asked, mal-ihsan, what is the meaning of al-ihsan? He said three things. Memorize these. بَذْلُ النَّدَى وَكَفُّ الْأَذَى وَالطَّلْقُ الْوَجْ Very easy. He said, الْإِحْسَانِ بَذْلُ النَّدَى Strive to benefit other people. Be a positive force in your community. وَكَفُّ الْأَذَى And stop irritating and harming other people. وَالطَّلْقُ الْوَجْ And smile in the face of the believers. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa said, أحب الناس إلى الله أنفعهم للناس. That the most beloved people to Allah are those who are most beneficial to the rest of the people. So also one of the ways to connect with Allah and to attain the love of Allah is be people of ihsan, be people of goodness, mend your relationships, forgive people's shortcomings, tolerate the irritations of people. Because Allah loves the people of Al-Ihsan. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bestow upon us His Rahmah and that He, pe and he makes His people of at taqwa and Sabr and He bestows upon us Al-Ikhlas and At-Tawheed. We ask Allah subhanahu wa to forgive our sins on this blessed night and I ask Allah subhanahu wa that He accepts from you your fasting and your charity and your du'as and your qiyam. Hada wallahu a'lam wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina wa sallam. جزاكم الله خير